morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday on the 20th of June. I have a few announcements. First, I am trialing different backgrounds with different font colors. So I want feedback from you all on how well you can see the screen today and see the words. So well, I'm rating like 1 to 10, 10 being great, 1 being not at all. Let me know and we'll keep trialing stuff until we find a good background and font color so that everyone can see the words on the screen. Because it's no fun if you can't see the words on the screen, especially since we can sing. If you can't see the words on the screen, you can't sing. And that just doesn't work for me. Second, uh, the offering plate is by the exit. So if you're making your way, Hazel's doing great at pointing. So if you're making your way out of the runway system, as you make your way out, you'll see it before you leave the door. And then finally, Warren, if you will wave, he doesn't know I'm doing this. Warren has been great and has been recording our services for the South Church and uploading them to YouTube so that those who cannot be here can still be able to watch and worship. And I'm going to ask for you all to think and to give it a real thought and not just, I don't do videos, I don't do technology, and see if you'd be willing to get trained by Warren on how to record and upload so that we can have a few volunteers so it doesn't just fall to one person. So have a think for yourself for more than a second and figure out if you'd be willing to learn. We won't just throw you off into the wilderness and say good luck. We would actually train you, so don't worry about that. With that, let us come up to our call to worship, which today comes from Psalm 148. Praise God from the heavens. Praise Him from the skies above. Praise God, angels, and all the hosts of heaven. Praise the sun and moon and shining stars. Praise God, all creatures great and small. Praise Him, animals and birds and reptiles and fish. Praise God, kings of the earth and people everywhere. Praise Him, men and women from heaven and the let all the earth bring praise to the Lord at whose word creation came into being. We gather to praise and worship our God. And let us stand and sing our opening hymn, hymn number 624. In Christ there is no east or west.
prayer. Eternal God, by your word you create, and by your breath you give life. We worship you with joy and thanksgiving, praising you for the fullness that your presence brings to our lives and our life together. We praise you that by your word you feed us. We are satisfied and there is always more. Your goodness is displayed in your wonderful works for all humanity and in your perfect love. In our humanity, we are rebellious and sometimes follow after foolish ideas, going ways which lead away from life with you. And yet, when we cry out, you are there, your word healing our inner emptiness and pain, embracing us, leading us in your life in place. For your unending faithfulness revealed to us in Christ Jesus and made present to us in your Holy Spirit. We praise you, Lord God. And now we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. We are smart in temptation, but the deliverance from evil. The divine is kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 17, and it's a selection of verses as you can see from the screen. The Philistines gathered their armies together for war. They met at Soko in Judah. The Philistines had a champion fighter named Goliath, who was from Gath. He was over nine feet tall. Goliath came out of the Philistine camp. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore a coat of armour that was made like the scales on a fish. This armour was made of bronze and weighed about 125 pounds. Goliath wore bronze protectors on his legs. He had a bronze javelin tied on his back. The wooden part of his spear was as big as a weaver's rod. The spear's blade weighed 15 pounds. Goliath's helper walked in front of him, carrying Goliath's shield. Each day, Goliath would come out and shout a challenge to the Israelite soldiers. He would say, Why are all of your soldiers lined up ready for battle? You are Saul's servants. I am a Philistine, so choose me one man and send him to fight me. If that man kills me, he wins, and we Philistines will become your slaves. But if I kill your man, then I win, and you will become our slaves. You will have to serve us. The Philistine also said, Today I stand and make fun of the army of Israel. I dare you to send me one of your men and let us fight. Saul and the Israelite soldiers heard what Goliath said, and they were very afraid. Your brothers are with Saul and all the Israelite soldiers in the valley of Elah. They are there to fight against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David had another shepherd take care of the sheep, while he took the food and left as Jesse had told him to. David drove their wagon to the camp. The soldiers were going out to their battle positions just as David arrived. The soldiers began shouting their war cry. The Israelites and Philistines were lined up, ready for battle. David left the food with the man who kept supplies. Then he ran to the place where the Israelite soldiers were and asked about his brothers. While David was talking with his brothers, the Philistine champion fighter came out from the Philistine army. This was Goliath, the Philistine from Gath. Goliath shouted things against Israel as usual. David heard what he said. David 
said to Saul, People should let Goliath discourage them. I am your servant. I will go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered, You can't go out and fight against this Philistine. You're not even a soldier. Goliath has been fighting more since he was a boy. But David said to Saul, There were times when I was taking care of my father's sheep, that wild animals came to take some sheep from the flock. Once there was a lion, and another time a bear. I chased that wild animal, attacked it, and took the sheep from its mouth. The wild animal jumped on me, but I caught it by the fur under its mouth, and I hit it and killed it. I killed both a lion and a bear like that. And I will kill that foreign Goliath just like them. Goliath will die because he made fun of the army of the living God. The Lord saved me from the lion and the bear. He will also save me from this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul put his own clothes on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and armour on his body. David put on the sword and tried to walk around, tried to wear Saul's uniform, but David was not used to all these heavy things. David said to Saul, I can't fight in these things. I'm not used to them. So David took them all off. The word of God for the people of God. And let's picture the scene. The scripture does such a great job at capturing the image. We have this man, probably about nine feet tall, with armor that weighed around 125 pounds, the small, the, the weight of a human being, like a small human being, is what this guy is wearing as armor on his body. And then we have this kid, the youngest of his family. Saul puts all this armor on him and he can't walk. Imagine like stumbling around and not, it's kind of like, with your legs outspread, you can't fit this armor on you and move. So he takes it off. And all he has is five stones. He doesn't have a sword, he doesn't have a shield, he doesn't have an axe. He has five stones and a slingshot. Now, if you didn't know the story and know how that how that goes and know the ending, by all reasoning and by all logic, Goliath should win this battle in like a second. By all numbers and by all the setting, there is no way in the world that David would ever be able to win this battle. It doesn't seem like it would be possible. Have there been times in your life when you've faced your own giant? Maybe you have something nine feet tall with armor and 125 pounds, but something so big that you look at it and you go, uh uh. And you would turn and run the other way. You're like, no way, not gonna happen. Uh, no, not gonna do it. For kids, this might be stressful school, exams, bullies, or facing a fear that possibly has the ability to stop them in their tracks. For adults, it's things like, you know, buying the first place, dealing with starting a new job, all of the unknowns of adulthood, where you're just like, I don't like how that looks, and that's too big for me. That wall is too big, I'm not going to get over it. You look at this challenge, at this scary thing, up and down, and you think there's no way you're going to make it through and still be standing at the top of the tail on the other side. David faces Goliath, small faces big, weak faces strong, no armor faces fully armored, and anyone watching expects the Goliath to go quickly defeat David. Yet, something different happens. When you're facing things in your life that you don't think you will be able to do, what are your reasonings for not being able to do it? 
Let me give you some examples and see if these ring true for you. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough experience. I'm not old enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not fit enough. I'm not fast enough. There's probably someone else better suited to do this. I'm not ready. The list can go on, and we're so good at making up reasons and excuses for why we should not be able to deal with these big challenges in our life. Yet David, this little shepherding boy David, he doesn't do this. Any reasonings or excuses he could easily use to not face Goliath, he doesn't use. In fact, Saul, the king, is the one who's throwing out all his excuses to David, thinking there's no way that David is going to be able to actually defeat Goliath. Yet David doesn't let those stop him. He reminds Saul about his gifts and experiences that he does have, and the strength that comes from his faith in God. David's been in a field watching over his sheep for probably about three years, a little bit less, a little bit more. And during this time, he's had to deal with and face with bears, lions, and other threats. So he knows how to defeat things which have more physical strength over him. Not only this, he is in this field by himself with lots of time to reflect, to pray, and to listen for God. Now, I want you to think about the free time that you might have if you were in a field without a mobile phone, without something to distract you, without some technology, which is you're so good at pulling out in a second to look at so that we don't have to deal with something else. Nothing to distract you from being present in God's creation. David is so strong in his faith of God, and he knows that he's been able to continue to protect his sheep because God has watched him with them. His confidence is fully placed in God's hands, and he's not relying on his own strength. He trusts that God will provide with him with what he needs, and he doesn't spend his time worrying about these things. Instead, he continues to nourish and grow his faith. You and I are invited to have faith like David does, fully putting our trust in God. Now you might be sitting there thinking, sure, sounds good, sounds easy. But here's the big thing that this also requires of you. Ready? <coughs> this means that we can't spend our time worrying about if we are good enough, if we have the right gifts and talents, have enough experience. Our faith in God invites us to fully trust that whatever God calls us to do, and wherever God calls us, God will equip us with what we need to be able to carry out what we are being called to do. We might not have to battle giants like David did, but whatever it might be, our job, our calling, is to fully trust in God and God's provisions. And during all parts of our lives, we continue to nourish and grow in your faith. <coughs> so that is your job, and not only today, not only this week, but the rest of your life. One, to take time to be in nature, like David was, without distraction. Maybe it's just stepping out in your front garden or back garden, or looking at the trees, looking at the sky, whether it's blue, whether it's cloudy. If it's raining, look at the sky from indoors, what I have you. But spend time with being in nature. And spend time in prayer, growing and nurturing your faith. And fully trust in God and God's provisions for your life. And with that, let us come into our next hymn, and number 501. Take this moment, sign, and grace. Space.
reading is from Mark chapter 4, reading verses 35 to 41. That day at evening, Jesus said to his followers, Come with me across the lake. So they left the crowd behind and went with Jesus in the boat he was already in. There were also other boats that went with them. A very bad wind came up on the lake. The waves were coming over the sides and into the boat, and it was almost full of water. Jesus was inside the boat, sleeping with his head on a pillow. The followers went and woke him. They said, Teacher, don't you care about us? We're going to drown. Jesus stood up and gave a command to the wind and the water. He said, Quiet, be still. Then the wind stopped and the lake became calm. He said to his followers, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were very afraid and asked each other, What kind of man is this? Even the wind and the water obey him. Amen. Thanks be to God for these readings from his most holy word. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Precious and loving God, be with us as we take this time to reflect on your word and to hear what you would have us hear today. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen. So I figured that one way for you to get to know me better was for me to tell you some things about me as part of my sermons. So these are the things that you might not otherwise learn about me. So here is your first fact about your new minister for today. I don't like being scared. Now just to clarify, I don't like being scared, but I do like being surprised. There is a difference. And I react in very different ways depending on if you just try to scare me or if you just surprise me. Anything that seems scary, going down a dark alley, haunted houses, etc., you can count on me to be doing, to not be doing those things. I'll be sitting outside, I'll be walking in the other direction. Not going to happen. And I figured because it is the two year anniversary of the day that you so him and Karen's side, I will give you another interesting fact about myself. I don't like roller coasters. I hate that feeling that your body gets when there's that sudden drop and your stomach is way up here in the air and your body is plummeting down to the ground. Not for me. My family and friends have tried to convince me to try them again convincing me that it'll be fine, and I continue to say no. I had no problem holding people's bags when they went on the rides. There is this one little coaster in a theme park in Georgia that I was willing to go on that had one drop, and it wasn't too much for me. But even in the beginning, when the roller coaster is going up the end line, so slowly, and you get to the top, there'd be the person at the top of the hill on the platform, and I would ask, more like beg them, to pause the ride, release the bar, and let me off. <laughs> that happened, but I always kept asking. Even though, even though I knew that it was coming, my fear and my lack of trust was running the show instead of just trusting and reminding myself that I would be okay and that I would make it through. Fear can have a way of stopping us from doing things or not allow us to trust things that are beyond our control. We admitted to each other last week that we like being in control and having control over things in our lives, even things we can't control. And when we can't control things, how willing are we to actually go and try that thing? 
And even if you start to try that thing, how much are you willing to fully commit to it or trust in it? Now, there are times that fear keeps us from doing things that help keep us safe. So, when fear speaks up about something that might put you at harm's way, listen to fear at that point. But when it keeps you from doing things just because you don't want to, tell it to be quiet and do it anyway. But fear also has a way of keeping us from where we are, keeping us where we are, almost as if our feet are cemented to the ground. And we can't move. Our passage from Mark today is one that you've probably heard many times. My guess is that we turn our eyes to the storm and the subsequent calming of the storm when we look at this passage. And that's a big part of this passage. And there's so much to learn and discuss from that, but I want to turn your eyes to something that happened before the calming of the storm, before they were in the boat on the sea. Jesus says to his disciples, let us, let us go across to the other side of the lake. He doesn't say, go across to the other side and I will meet you there, or I'm going to cross and then you will follow after. Jesus goes with them across the lake, those eight miles or so, from one side to the other. The disciples are not alone on the boat. They have Jesus with them. Now, some of these disciples were fishermen, so they've been on boats during bad storms. So it's probably safe to say that they were used to bad storms on all boats. But what they were not used to was having someone in the boat who might be able to help them when the storm got too bad, worse than what they were used to. I have no doubt that each of you had storms in your life, some worse than others. You lived to tell, tell the tale, even though you might have some bumps or bruises from those storms. But once you get to the other side, you see things in a whole new way, and you have grown. You might have felt like the disciples during this storm, thinking there was no way you were going to survive, but somehow you made it through. These disciples are on the boat, the waves are all around them, and at the moment they are sure they're going to perish. They're convinced that they're not going to survive the storm, but they're not alone. They are not on the boat alone or battling the storm alone. Jesus is there with them, albeit asleep, but nonetheless, he is there. So when you've done that thing, something risky, perhaps dangerous or uncertain, how likely were you to do it by yourself? When someone said, let's go do this, and it looked really scary, and they said, you go first, I'll follow, and maybe they said, I'll go first and you follow, how likely were you to go on your own? Now, I know that I'd be more likely to find some way to get out of it. I would talk myself out of it, delay it, whatever I could do to get out of doing it. I've actually been known to be at queues and rides of roller coasters and find some way to give an excuse to my friend to get out of doing a roller coaster. Even though, even though they said, I'll sit with you. It's like, uh-uh, not going to do it. But I'd say, okay, okay, okay. And we get close, I'm like, I need to go use the toilet. And I'd run off and I went and come back. <laughs> now, what difference would it make if someone took your hand and said that they would do it with you, would you do it? If you were on a high dive board and someone said, I'll jump with you, how more likely would you be willing to jump than if they said, go by yourself? If you knew and were reassured that whatever thing you were getting ready to face, you were not facing it alone, what difference does that make to you? This is what we are given to Jesus. 
When we are facing the storms in our lives, we do not face them alone. When we are going through scary changes in our lives, we do not go through them alone. Remember that they were on a boat to go to the other shore. Big changes, whether moving at location, starting something new, or something else scary. These are all times when the thought of change is just as scary as taking the first step. The other side of the lake that the disciples of Jesus were heading to was an unknown place for them. It was something different and new, and they didn't know what was in store for them on the other side. As you all know, life is a series of changes, new experiences, and moves. We don't get to stay in the same place ever. You might start in one place, but you don't get to stay there. At some point in each of your lives, you have to move. You are, at some point, you're in a place where you no longer belong. You have to move out of your childhood home, start a new job, change jobs, get married, have children, and many other things. In life, we are not meant to stay in the same place or do things the way that we did them before. A phrase that I think we all use, and when I was writing this, I put we are all guilty of using but I changed it because I don't want to tie guilt to it. But we all use a lot is we've always done it this way. Raise your hand if you use that phrase. We've always done it this way. Hold it proudly, it's okay. Whether it is as simple as setting the table, where the napkin goes, how the cutlery goes, where the plates go, where the cups go. I remember uh, I was given these Tiffany Table Manor books by my dad. I didn't get one, I got two. So I don't know what that said about me growing up, but it teaches you the proper way to set the table. We like to do things the way they've always been done. But we can't do that. When we're trying to figure out a way to do something new, it is so easy to go back to what you've known. How you've always done things before. It's comfortable. It's known. It's safe. It's like a big old warm blanket. It's like, ah, oh, this feels great. I'm in my safety zone. But if we stay in the same place, we never, never grow. We never make room for new experiences, new lessons. A quote that I came across recently said, growth is painful. Change is painful. But nothing is as painful as staying stuck somewhere you don't belong. We know when it is time to get into the boat and cross to the other side. We might face storms during this journey, but the amazing thing is that we are never alone on this boat. Jesus is there with us from one shore to the other side. And as you might know, and as I've mentioned earlier, so if you're paying attention at the beginning of the sermon, today, the 20th of June, is the birthday of Stone Heaven Parenside. Two years ago, you got in the boat as two different churches, and you've been journeying across the sea to the other side. We are reaching the other shore and stepping foot onto this new land as a new church, as Stone Heaven Parenside. Now it's scary, because we were leaving behind what we have known for so many years. We are leaving behind on the other shore the familiar, the same, the same old, the way we've always done it before. Now for some of you, like me because I'm a newcomer, this seems exciting. Yay, new things! Now for some of you, this is really daunting because you don't want to let go of the old. You like things the way they were. And other, uh, others of you might just feel stuck, wanting to go back to the other shore, or not even wanting to get on the boat. You want to stay where you feel safe. Now, we don't know what will be on the other shore, 
We don't know what our future will look like as children in the caring side. We don't know how difficult or easy it will be able to be to create and be in this new church. But what we do know is that we have each other. I want you to all to look around the sanctuary right now and see that we're all in this journey together. We have each other. We know that we are not alone in this. Jesus is on this journey with us. We also know that no matter how rough it might be, we are called to be the beloved community walking alongside each other and supporting each other. And your goal is to continue to have faith, to continue to believe that even in the worst of times, when we are running low on hope, have each other, and Jesus is there to calm the storm and guide us through to the other side and to continue the journey with us. Your act of faith is taking Jesus' invitation to heart to get into the boat, maybe to get on the roller coaster, and believing that the other side is not only possible but it is essential. We cannot stay where we have been. Close, I'm going to read this poem that that minister wrote that relates to this. And it says, When the storm is still and the seas are calm, what then? When disruption eases and a new normal takes hold, what then? And all the signs we witnessed along the way, where we felt despair and blessed hope, how have we been changed by the journey? Who will we be when we leave the boat and step into new territory, carrying the baggage of all that is unfinished with us to the other side? For it is not the end of the journey, but a call to come ashore and meet the new challenges that await our attention in the knowledge that the Jesus who rebukes the wind and calms the waves alights with us on the other side. If this world didn't get in the boat, we wouldn't have a world that we know and love today. Change is inevitable, but we just have to get in the boat with Jesus. Battle the storms, call on his name, and go to the other shore. So let's meet these new challenges together, knowing that Jesus is there with us through it all. You might have times you don't like it. You might have times when you want excuses to get out of it. You might have times when you're scared that what is in front of what is in front of you, where your stomach is ten feet above you, and your body might feel like it's plummeting to the ground. But Jesus is there taking your hand, sitting with each of you, walking with each of you. And through that, we will be able to keep going. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite those who are able to stand, stand as we sing our next hymn. Hymn number 166, Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy. Let us stand and make the joyful noise of the Lord.
Oh God, our faith in your power and your providence is strengthened today in our reflection upon the experience of David and his encounter with Goliath the giant. You remind us that there is nothing in all creation that is more powerful than your word in all of its two-edged glory. By it, Jesus calmed the storm, by it, he healed and made people whole, and by it, we too are sustained from day to day and from minute to minute. Help us, O oh God, to cling to your living word and to root ourselves in it, that we may be a people who overcome all the trials and tribulations that come upon us. Lord, hear our prayer. We are reminded today, O oh God, of how the strong can be defeated by the weak, of how the exalted and the mighty can be overcome by those who are humble and lowly, and we thank you for this. We pray, O oh God, for all those today who are oppressed, for all those today who are ill, who are in hospital, who are overcoming things. We ask you, Lord, to be with those in our community who need your presence and need your love. Grant them faith and in faith, grant them courage, and in them bring them about peace and hope. We pray today, O God, for all those who live in fear and insecurity, for those who need encouragement, and for those who need our help and the help of their neighbors and the communities if they are known that life is. But there's no light in this goodness. Lord, hear our prayer. And Lord, as we step into this new day, into this new week, help us to keep our minds and our eyes on you, being ever present to the ways that you are moving and working in this world. Help us to take time to nourish our faith, to take time in prayer. Take time with each other to build each other up and be with us as we journey together into this new and strange land. As we step onto this new shore and discover what it's like to be a community in this new setting. And we ask all this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's stand and sing our final hymn. Number 522, the church is wherever God's people are praising.
friends, beloved community, go out. Don't let fear stop you. Be willing to get in the boat and step onto the new shore, knowing that God is with you wherever you go. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from this day on and forevermore.